Hello and good afternoon. My name is Caroline. Thank you for joining me today. I have just been standing up here spinning my Camp Circle City Challenge coin that I got for being a speaker. Um, I would like to, since this is being videotaped, um, give props to Circle City Con for definitely the best badges of any con that I've been to. We're here today to talk about application security metrics. Um, I began my information security career 12 years ago and over the past four years have been focused on application security. I suspect that folks who came to today's talk are interested in learning about application security or maybe you're already doing application security and in some cases you may be asked as part of your job to talk about application security, maybe to justify budget or ask for resources, maybe explain to a development organization why application security is important uh, and why you need their help. Um, there are other audiences that uh, require talking about application security. These might include not only executives and development teams, but also folks like auditors, regulators, and customers. Um, quick show of hands, I am curious to know if anyone in here is new to application security and kind of thinking about it or learning about it for the first time. Does anyone else do application security for your job? And is anyone ever in the position of having to talk about application security? Okay, cool. Um, so I began my career at eBay in 2005. I was on the global information security team. And at that time, they hired a CISO named Dave Cullinane. And Dave came in and he really sort of shook up the information security function at eBay. Prior to Dave coming on board, the financial investment in information security had been around $2 million a year. He made the pitch to the executives at the company that it really ought to be $30 million, and they gave it to him. He asked me to be the chief of staff for the team, and about six months after the budget was approved, he said to me, okay, now we have some of the people on board, we've hired a lot of consultants, we've bought technology, and we have projects in place. Now it's critical that we define security metrics the value of the program and ensure that we get ongoing investment because an information security budget is not a one-time allocation. We need to help people understand that this is something that's ongoing. After eBay, I did information security at Zynga before transitioning to the vendor side of things. Um, I've done product management at Symantec, some consulting with Sigital, which is now Synopsys, and most recently, last year, I joined a startup in San Francisco called Cobalt. Uh, we do crowdsourced pen testing. And if anyone's interested in learning more about that, um, then I have some crowdsourced pen testing for dummies books uh, that I wrote uh, and recently came out. So anyone's welcome to grab one after the talk. Today we're going to talk a little bit about what is application security. I know that you guys all know what application security is, but we're going to start just sort of basics. Um, because we are talking about talking to people about application security who don't always know what application security is. So I wanted to start from the very beginning. We'll talk about some questions from executives, and this could be questions from executives, it could also be questions from the business or from any of those other audiences that we discussed, audi auditors, regulators, customers. The point being questions from anyone who is not an expert in application security. And this is the part of the presentation where if you want to, you can participate. Um, so I do have another microphone to walk around with if folks want to volunteer and share questions that they 
we've received from executives or from anyone else about application security. I want to talk about risk management objectives. So there is there's a topic in our industry called risk tolerance. How much risk is an organization willing to take on? And that can be a more challenging conversation than simply asking someone, so what's your risk tolerance? Uh, and so I want to share a few ways that I think are good approaches to having that risk tolerance discussion. Um, as part of working for a crowdsourced pen test firm, we actually have a crowdsourced pen test platform. And so we've got this really interesting data that we take, took a look at, we analyzed, and we published a report earlier this year that I want to share some of the findings with you. And I want to take a closer look at what is currently my favorite application security metric. Um, I don't know of very many organizations who are actually implementing it yet, um, but I think that's due to a data problem, which I'll talk about as well. So what is application security? I know you know, um, but it's just about improving the security of software. So this happens along a software development life cycle. There are opportunities to secure software at, during requirements and during design and while it's being built and while it's being operated. At the end of the day, we want to make sure that our applications are resilient to either unintentional error, but also to malicious attack. Uh, for a few years, when I was doing consulting with Sigital, I was performing what's called BSIM assessments. So is, is anyone familiar with the BSIM? For anyone who hasn't um, taken a look at the BSIM, I highly recommend it, bsimm.com. So the situation with BSIM is that eight or nine years ago, um, a few very smart people in our industry noticed that some other very smart people in our industry were talking about what should be done when it comes to application security. You should, you know, A, B, C. Um, and these particular smart people, namely Gary McGraw um, and Sammy Miguez and Brian Chess um, and Jacob West, they asked a slightly different question. The question that they asked was, what's actually going on in application security? And in that first year, what they did was they talked to nine different organizations and they wrote down all the things that they found. I think that first year they identified 110 distinct activities that were being done in application security. And since that time, they've continued to interview organizations and find out what sorts of application security activities are actually operational and happening in today's world. Um, so the BSIM is a model. Uh, currently, it includes 113 distinct controls. Um, and organizations can use this information to come up with new ideas about what they'd like to do in their application security programs. Um, they can also self-evaluate to determine what sorts of activities they are performing and compare that to other organizations uh, that are in the data pool. So BSIM is something that I highly recommend that folks look into. Um, it, it does indicate that the organizations that know how to do application security best are doing a combination of both engineering as well as governance activities. So I'm going to play a couple of YouTube videos. And don't worry, my whole talk isn't YouTube videos, but these are particularly interesting to me. One of the reasons why they're very interesting is because this is video from a United States Senate testimonial in 1998. We are literally talking almost 20 years ago. And I want you to listen to the video and tell me, or think to yourself, <laughs> You know, how relevant is this today, 20 years later? You, uh, you state that, uh, that uh, with regard to, to commerce over the Internet, which is uh, rapidly growing, as we all know, that uh, the Internet was not designed for it. Well, what do you mean by that? 
Uh, the internet was designed out of the uh, Defense Department's Advanced Research Project Agency to simply have computers talk to each other. Um, this was a very laudable act and a laudable goal, and I think they succeeded fantastically. Uh, this was largely an academic environment uh, with some government research organizations. It grew up, it flourished, it, it struck everybody by surprise, and now big business is saying, well, let's, let's, um, let's jump on board and uh, make some money off of this. Well, you know, this, this is kind of like if you've driven in Boston, you know, the streets aren't tremendously designed in a wonderful fashion because they followed the cows around and laid the pavement down. I mean, you can get it to work, but it can be really painful. And that's... So, brief show of hands, does anyone think that's relevant information today? Uh, and after watching, you know, a, a highly publicized, you know, really important Senate testimonial, you know, I look at things like the 2004 version of the OWASP Top 10, and I compare that to the 2013 version, and even, you know, the upcoming version that's going to be released later this year, and there's an awful lot of stuff that's the same. Um, so it's kind of like we've had decades of really smart people working on this problem, you know, but why is it that some of these problems continue to exist? Um, and I believe that Yes, there are some very challenging technical problems to be solved, but a lot of those have been solved and a lot of those can be solved. Um, I think that sometimes what can be even more challenging than some of the technical pieces may be the people and the process pieces. And so that's one of the reasons why security metrics is really interesting to me um, because I think it's about people talking about what needs to be done um, and hopefully being able to justify um, activity as well as measure the results of that activity. So if I think about it at a very high level, sure, BSIM has 113 activities, but I really think that application security, for the most part, can be boiled down to three major principles. One of them is finding security problems. Another one is fixing security problems. Uh, and finally, we come to preventing security problems from reoccurring or from being introduced in the first place. So questions from executives. I was at a conference in Denver recently the Rocky Mountain Information Security Conference. And one of the workshops uh, that was part of that conference was like a security leaders forum. And it was hosted by ENY. And the topic of the workshop was presenting about information security to a board of directors and to an audit committee. And the room was full of CISOs. And some of the folks were saying, you know, when I talk about what I do, I really have to dumb it down for these people. And I thought to myself, you know, the executives of these companies and the folks that are sitting on the board of directors, these are not dumb people. These are actually really smart people. They just don't happen to be experts in application security. And where do they, how do they how do they gain their knowledge about application security? You know, largely through mainstream media. Um, an executive might be on a plane and pick up a cop copy of Fortune magazine or the Wall Street Journal and find out that, you know, the Yahoo breach resulted in a significant discount uh, when they sold to Verizon. Um, Eight percent is a lot of money when you're talking about a $4.48 billion deal. Um, you know, another one that's that's been big that, you know, a business executive might sort of catch wind of is what happened to the Target CEO after those breaches. You know, we're talking about an individual who had really worked his way up the ranks at Target to become CEO, had a long history there, and while, you know, the breach was one of a few different reasons, um, he was actually asked to resign. So these are where sort of application security and business impact intersect. So I don't think that executives 
need information to be dumbed down for them. I do think that they need to hear from someone who is an expert in application security and have some recognition that they're not an expert. Um, I like to say that when it comes to executives and application security, it's a complicated relationship because on one hand, executives want their applications to be secure. They don't want breaches. They don't want bad press. They don't want to be out of compliance so they can't do business. On the other hand, if they're putting money into application security, that's money that's not going into product development or marketing or something that might have a more concrete or a more tangible return on investment. So I'm going to play a couple more seconds from the same video. Oh, I've been like not even on presenter mode. Um, I'm going to play a few more seconds from this video. Um, and I think it speaks to the complicated relationship between executives and application security professionals. Why don't strong authentication properties exist in these protocols? Most likely the same reason that simple security mechanisms are missing from all of the software or almost all of the software sold to cor corporations and agencies today. It's cheaper and it's easier for companies to sell insecure software. There's no liability attached to the manufacturers and there's no policing done to stop companies from selling insecure software under the guise of secure. In an industry where time to market matters, who wants or cares to add security or even thoroughly test their product? Well, you should. You, the government and consumer, should care and want software products to include security and authentication mechanisms. So again, that's a video from almost 20 years ago, but I think it's still very applicable today. Now, I'm going to put my presentation on presenter mode and um, talk to you guys about some questions from executives. So get ready, because this is almost the audience participation part. Um, so I've observed that many executives ask the wrong questions about application security. And it's not because they're dumb. It's because they're trying to take what they understand about how other parts of their business run and apply it to a part of their business that they're not an expert in. So two of the questions that I've heard of that I think are the wrong questions to ask are, number one, how does our bug count compare to that of our peers? So I think that that's not the best question to ask for a number of reasons. The first reason is because my application and my peers' application or my competitor's application are probably totally different. Um, you know, they might be running on completely different tech stacks. We might have software organizations that have very different philosophies on the use of free and open source software. There are so many different ways in which our applications might be different. The second reason why I think asking about comparing a bug count to another organization's bug count is not really useful is because every organization has a different application security program and has different types of defect discovery uh, activities that they're doing. So if my organization has like a very mature static analysis program and we run it all the time on our entire code base, I'm probably going to have a different bug count for inherent reasons than my competitor who might just do one manual pen test a year. Um, and so that's an example of a conversation that you could have with an executive to explain, hey, you know, this is not a useful question to ask. Uh, let me help you understand why, uh, and let me ask a different type of question. So the second example of a question that I don't really think is useful is, what is our mean time to respond to incidents? The reason I don't think that this question is very useful is because, first of all, when a security incident occurs, it's very unlikely that people are keeping really careful track of time. 
Um, it's more likely, you know, in my experience with major breaches and the activities that follow, um, you know, making sure you have timestamps on any everything um, isn't isn't really like the best use of your time. Um, the other thing is, why are you asking that question? Why are you gathering that data? Presumably, if you're asking a question and looking for a data-driven response, then, then the reason you're asking that question is because if you had the data, then you might do something different. But when it comes to something like, how long does it take us to respond to an incident? The answer is pretty obvious. You want to respond as quickly as you can, no matter what. So I think that to spend time and energy gathering that data, maybe there's an opportunity to do something different with that time and that energy. When it comes to incident response, I think if you have an incident response plan in place, you know who to call, under what circumstances, and if you're doing tabletop exercises and post-mortems, then you're probably in decent shape. Um, but I think that asking the question of, you know, how long did it take to, for us to respond, it's just not really a useful starting point. Now, there are some questions that, in my mind, are absolutely the right questions to ask. And these aren't necessarily easy questions to answer. But questions like, okay, I gave you what you asked for in terms of investment for your application security program. What impact did that have on our risk posture? That, in my opinion, is a really legit question to ask and one that can actually be the start of a fruitful conversation. Another one is, what's the value that I'm getting for my money, or for our money? So here is the audience participation part. Um, does anyone want to share with the group what sorts of questions they might be getting about their application security programs or their information security problem or programs um, that might or might not be useful starting points? We're doing uh, DevOps, and we're doing what's right by the customer. How can we just tell the customer the right thing so we can give them our product? Ah, I'll, I'll repeat it on the microphone because they asked me to. Um, we're doing DevOps, and the customer is asking us about security. You know, what can we do to just tell them something and then move on? Um, yeah. <laughs> I have a different talk um, that I'm actually going to be presenting at... Um, at, at, a, at a conference in September that's about um, security and why for DevOps organizations, security is all about making sales. Um, but that is a separate conversation from today. I think that in that case, there's an opportunity to use the customer demand to justify security activities. If, for example, your customer's insisting on, that you do a pen test, you know, that's an opportunity for you to say, and we should do a pen test. Um, now, there may be things that you know are appropriate to do that are not exactly what your customer is asking for, and I think that's the more challenging follow-up to a question like that one. Um, I am, in this presentation, going to present a few ideas on, on how you could try and make some of those arguments. Thank you for sharing. Yes? One of the questions we get is, what's the number along with what's the threshold and the limit that end up coming basically out of your butt? Yeah. So the question is, um, you know, what is the number? What's the magical number? And what's the threshold that we need to be aware of? And what's the limit? Because for someone who is new to a field and trying to learn about a field, you know, they understand that there are things like thresholds and there are, in some cases, things like magical numbers. Um, in application security, it doesn't really work like that, as, as folks know, um, particularly because when it comes to like specific numbers, um, we can sometimes imply a level of precision that's really inaccurate. Um, so, yeah. Any other questions that people get? from people who don't know the best way to start this kind of conversation? 
I love asking this uh, when I have opportunities to do this talk because I get different ones every time. These are these are really good ones. Um, so now I'm going to propose um, an idea um, about how to how to talk about these things. I'm going to start out um, with a small story. So. In 2010, I was on the security team at Zynga. Zynga happened to be one of those security teams that was created because they had some big bad incidents happen, and then the executives didn't want those to happen anymore, so they hired security people. We were also getting ready for an IPO. And the security team was put in place, and then we had a new CIO come in. And she talked to my boss, who was a CISO, and she said, you know, it seems as though you've hired some really smart people and they seem to be really busy all the time. But I have no idea what they're doing. And more importantly than that, I don't know if they're doing the right things. And more importantly than that, I don't even know how I would know if they were doing the right things. So CIO says to CISO, tell me how I should think about this. And in that particular case, they decided to align with an industry framework, which was ISO 27001. And we hired a third party to come in and do an assessment. And that gave her a lot of confidence because she was able to say, okay, you know, this very reputable firm came and told us a number, uh, and we know that we need to change that number in this direction. That's not actually um, what I'm talking about today. I'm not going to say, you know, NIST CSF is the magical framework or, you know, ISO 27034, it's coming out soon, it's going to be great. That's, I, I believe that best practices and frameworks are really useful for having some of these conversations, but that's not actually the direction I'm going in. So here's, here's what I've got. Um, at a very high level, so we talked about what is application security. And I think when it comes to an executive or a business person, what he or she wants to know is what's going to help my business and what's going to hurt my business. So at a really high level, good software helps our business, bad software hurts our business. Really basic stuff. People can probably get on board with that. So at this same um, conference that I mentioned in Denver last month, at the same workshop, uh, one of the EY guys gets up and says, you know, I was meeting with uh, a CISO for a major airline the other day, and she is expressing to me her concerns about how there's no more loyalty to the airlines. You know, people just go wherever it's cheap and, and, and stuff like that. So this EY guy says to her, and he's trying to make the point that information security is important and, and that you should be prepared for security incidents. And he says to her, uh, you know, what would happen if one of your airplanes crashed and somebody asked you what happened and, and you didn't know and somebody asked you when it would be fixed and you didn't know. And she was like, that would be devastating to my business. And he sort of was like, haha, information security is the same thing. Something bad happens and you can't answer questions about it. That's bad too. And it was kind of like, okay, that's fine. That's an analogy. And maybe in some types of businesses, an analogy is a really good step forward. Um, but I'd like to propose something more detailed than that. Something that can actually line up with an action plan. So um, the approach that I'd like to propose is to start with risk management objectives. So how can we take a concept like Good software helps business, bad software hurts business, and get a little bit more detailed than that. Um, how can we encourage or even ask uh, the right questions, right meaning questions that are going to lead to a fruitful conversation, and how can we answer those questions with data in order to show progress along an action plan that we've agreed to? So the point I suppose is that there's an opportunity for application security professionals, for information security professionals to say to whoever it is that we need to say this to, hey, you know, I've thought about this, I've analyzed it, I've come up with a plan. Can we agree that the plan is intended to accomplish the shared goal that we have? You know, if, if, if we can agree to that, then 
I'm just going to do the plan, and I need you to trust me to update you on my progress with the plan and to update you if anything goes wrong with the plan. So can we just put together an objective and a plan, and can everyone just get on board? So here's what I got. What is a way to start a risk tolerance discussion beyond good software good, bad software bad? One of them is a little bit like what this gentleman was referring to. Um, how can we use application security as a competitive differentiator? If our customers are asking about security, then how can we publicly talk about what we do for security and then make sure we're actually doing those things? Another one is kind of like, you know, how does our bug count compare to that of our peers or competition? But this variation on that is, I think, a little bit more useful because um, an actually useful question, I think, is, well, is not how does our bug count compare, but how do our activities compare, and how does our level of investment compare? So at the beginning of this talk, I talked about um, Dave Cullinane, the CISO at eBay, and one of the ways that he was able to convince his executive management to provide more funding for the information security program was by calling up all of his CISO buddies and saying, how much money are you getting? And then he took all that information and he put it on a PowerPoint slide and he showed the executives and he said, look how severely underfunded we are. So if you're a CISO and you have CISO buddies, you know, that's an easy thing to do. Not all of us are in that position. And if you're not in that position, then maybe something like BSIM um, is a good tool to use to say, OK, well, what sorts of activities is my organization performing? And how does that compare to either you know, the BSIM data pool or maybe um, an industry-specific vertical? Yes? We use that exactly to demonstrate maturity in our industry. Cool. That's really cool. I'm glad to hear that. I'm a big BSIM fan. Um, it's good stuff. So the next one I want to present is, it's a little fluffy, but maybe it works for certain types of executives, particularly in certain types of business areas, which is we have to achieve a defensible level of due care. We have to say to someone, yeah, we, we did the responsible thing. Like I have a toddler at home. She's two years old. And we have a baby gate at the top of our stairs. That's like a that's like a reasonable thing to do. If I didn't have that, maybe I wouldn't be exhibiting a defensible level of due care. So that one's a little fluffy for my taste, but you can, you know, maybe put together um, some sub bullets about what that means for your particular organization. Um, and finally, this one's sort of obvious: comply with whatever regulatory requirement, contractual requirements are really sort of convenient in some cases, um, or industry standards. Um, so here are some other ones. Um, I like these the best because I think they're sufficiently detailed that you can put a plan behind them, but they're also sufficiently high level that they make sense to a lot of different people. So the first one is, can I get you to sign up and agree to the idea that we want to reduce the probability that attackers can cause our critical applications to stop functioning. Like, how do you say how do you say no to that, right? And then, you know, it's it's relatively easy to put a plan in place. Um, another one is, hey, can I get you to sign up for the idea that we as an organization are going to require fixes for bugs for which well-known attacks exist. Because how often does an organization spend its time and money finding security issues and then really struggle with actually getting those fixed? Um, and thirdly, and one I'm actually going to be going into a little more detail throughout this conversation, can I get you to agree that we want to prevent the same application security defects from occurring over and over again. So this is like this is like my exciting slide. Um, but anyway, we'll we'll keep going. Pen test metrics. So as I mentioned, I work for a crowdsourced pen test firm. 
uh, and we deliver our pen test results in a crowdsourced pen test platform. And so we did an analysis of that data, uh, and I'd like to share that with you. So there are two types of application security pen test metrics that we looked at. Um, one of them is program level. So what that means is for an organization's pen test program, what are some metrics that you could use to evaluate the effectiveness of that program? And the second kind is for a particular pen test engagement. I'm going to go through each of these, um, so I'm not going through them now. So the first one is portfolio coverage. Now, the term coverage can mean different things in different contexts. Uh, coverage might mean you have a software portfolio of many different applications, and you want to cover all of the applications in your portfolio. Coverage could also refer to um, within a single application using a checklist like the OWASP top 10 or the ASVS to ensure that testing of that particular application uh, is fully covered. Coverage could also refer to the amount of information that's being provided to the person who's doing the testing. So white box or gray box or black box testing. In this case, I'm actually talking about the first one. So software portfolio, lots of applications, you know, are you testing your applications appropriately? So I think that a good approach to security is a risk-based one. The idea here being that if you have a software portfolio and you've got, for example, 10 applications in it, some of those applications are probably more important than others, and some of them probably have higher risk ratings than others. So um, a risk-based application security program might apply different application security controls to different applications based on their risk ratings. This is an example um, of an organization who has decided, OK, out of the applications in my software portfolio, some of those applications are critical. And for all of the critical applications, we're going to pen test them every year. Yeah, every year. Um, so this is sample data. Some of the data here is going to be real data, and some of it's going to be sample data. Um, in this case, this is sample data. And it's really straightforward. So if we have 10 apps, we tested seven of them, and we haven't tested three. This is like, this is like the most straightforward. Um, it gets a little more exciting, I promise. Um, so pen test frequency. Um, so BSIM says that you should periodically test an application even if there haven't been any changes. And that could be like once every three years, once every five years. It doesn't need to be super rapid. Um, but attackers do evolve, and new vulnerabilities get disclosed. And an application which, even if it hasn't changed, it might be vulnerable if software updates haven't been installed recently. So on one end of the spectrum, BSIM is saying, test all your stuff e periodically, even if it hasn't changed. On the other end of the spectrum, you've got regulatory compliance frameworks like PCI, SOX, and HIPAA saying you need to test once a year. In my opinion, that should really be like a bare minimum amount. Um, a lot of organizations that I've consulted for will ask the question, well, how often do our peers pen test? Uh, which I think is actually a useful question. Um, but I, what I think is a little more use, a little more useful of a question is, to ask, how frequently do we release new software? What's our development cycle? And are we testing appropriately? So if we're releasing new software six times a year, but we're only testing twice a year, you know, maybe you want to up that. So we do have some real data um, based on all of the pen tests, about 100, that were conducted in 2016 um, and, and which have results in the platform. Um, so 14.8% of those organizations bought quarterly pen tests, 38.7% of them bought semi-annual pen tests, and 46.5% of those bought annual pen tests. We do plan to release a version of the same report every year. So when we release the next version, hopefully in the spring of 2018, this will not be um, like one data point, but it'll be a trend line. And I'm really curious to know 
if um, if the if this changes, right? I'm really curious to know if more organizations are testing more frequently. Yes. Yeah. 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 The, this gentleman makes what I think is a very strong point, which is, you know, this data is a little bit interesting, but it would probably be a lot more interesting if you were able to also show of these organizations how frequently were they releasing software, because then you'd have some context uh, to the numbers. And then you could actually look at those too. So we'll, we'll see. We'll see what we can do with the data next year, uh, and we'll see if we can talk to each of those organizations and, and gather that data. Thanks for the input. Uh, time to fix. So this is something that I feel very strongly about, which is that fixing security bugs matters. Because if you don't look for security bugs, they're probably there, even if you don't know that they're there. If you do look for them and you find some, then they're still going to be there until they get fixed or otherwise eliminated. Um, so fixing really matters. Um, and, uh, you know, I think organizations ought to have a goal to fix critical findings as soon as possible. Now, not every security bug is a critical bug. Um, and a lot of organizations have different remediation SLAs for different criticalities of security bug or even for different uh, risk rated applications. So, you know, an organization might say if we find a critical bug, it needs to be fixed in 48 hours, you know, but if we find a low level bug, you know, it doesn't need to be fixed for 90 days, 180 days, maybe it never gets fixed. Um, I think that time to fix is really important and it's really important to have some of these SLAs written down and in place because you can spend time and money finding security issues, but when it comes to fixing those security issues, somebody has to convince a developer who actually has a capability to fix it that they need to not spend their time on creating a new feature or meeting one of their deadlines, and they're actually going to spend some of their very limited bandwidth on prioritizing and fixing a security issue. Um, so yeah, I don't have I don't have data for this one. This one's kind of a tough one to have data for. Talent ratings. So this one is also exciting for me. Um, to have an effective pen test, it's really essential that there are talented pen testers doing the work. Um, an experienced pen tester knows how to do much more than just run a scan and review the findings. Um, they can think creatively, they can think maliciously, they can mimic an attacker scenario. Um, so it's really critically important if you want to have a quality pen test that you need to find matching skills for what the pen tester knows how to do that match your actual tech stack. You want to have many years of ideally professional experience, and you want those folks to be highly rated by people that they've worked with and by people that they've worked for in the past. So one of the really cool things about having a crowdsource pen test platform is we basically have like a built-in Yelp. So you can say, okay, um, you know, the difference perhaps is working with a more traditional consulting firm you know, in some case, you get like a really big name and, and you get their resume and you know, like, this person did this really cool thing. Um, but in other cases, you know, you're just signing up for, you know, kind of whoever is available. And, and maybe it's somebody who has a more generalist skill set. Um, but I think ideally you'd want to find someone who has a specialist skill set and experience in what you're looking for, as well as having been highly rated for the work that they've done in the past. So another metric that we have been thinking about is new issues found. So it's impossible to definitively know if all the security issues were found in any given pen test. Um, but it is something that you could actually count and track is how many of the findings are new versus something that you already knew about. And if you already knew about it, why hasn't it been fixed? And maybe it was like a low criticality one, so it doesn't need to be fixed yet, but there's a plan to fix it later in the future. Um, 
But as far as new findings in a pen test, um, those can be an indication of a quality pen tester who really knows what he or she is doing. Um, and then the other question might be, well, why wasn't it found earlier? So for organizations that do more than just pen testing, like maybe they have ways to find security issues earlier in the software development lifecycle, then if issues are found in a pen test, it means that this piece of code, depending on when you do the pen test, made it all the way through the software development lifecycle without that security issue being found. And why was that the case? So there can also be sort of an indicator of how well your secure SDLC is working from a process perspective. So this is sample data, um, but you could, um, for your different pen tests, keep track of how many of your findings are new versus how many did you already know about. Findings criticality. Um, so we've talked a little bit about how some findings are more critical than others and also about how developer teams don't always have like unlimited time to fix security issues. Um, so uh, the way that a lot of organizations determine criticality for a particular security issue is by looking at business impact and then also likelihood. Um, and the idea, obviously, is that you should remediate the critical ones first. If you can, sometimes you can't for other reasons. Um, like you have stuff depending on it being a certain way. Um, so this is real data. So for the pen tests we did, 9% um, of them were critical uh, and about 70% of them were low. I think this is pretty typical. Um, so we're back to issues fixed. Uh, again, I'm gonna, I say this a lot. Um, and I'm fine with that. Finding security issues is great, but fixing is what actually improves application security, even though it's not easy to do. Um, so in this case, um, this is also sample data, but I think it's really important to look both at defects found as well as defects fixed. So vulnerability types. Um, this is what I'm gonna dive into a little more. Um, so the OWASP TAP10 is great, um, but what could maybe ev be even greater is if an organization knew about its top 10, because who cares about the top 10 for the world um, if what really matters is your organization's actual top 10, and how could you use that? So I have this idea that if you could capture this data, visualize it, analyze it, count the number of instances of different vulnerability types, then you can actually use that information to strategically eliminate types of vulnerabilities from your code base. Um, and you could do things like focus your detection and your fixing and your prevention strategies all around the types of security vulnerabilities that actually have been found in your own code. This is gonna be unique to every organization. So this is real data for the pen test that we did in 2016. This is actually the top 11. And the reason it's 11 is because number 11 is SQL injection. Um, so this, um, I want to take a closer look at this. Um, if anyone's interested in this data, actually, I'll send a link. I may have it actually included at the end of this presentation um, to the report with all this data so you can refer to it after the session. So we're going to take a closer look at top vulnerability types. We have about 10 minutes, so we're going to go quick. Um, at Sigital, I consulted for three dozen different application security programs. And I've probably looked at another dozen in my time at Cobalt. Many organizations have the same situation going on for application security. They have some means of defect discovery. Usually it's like one pen test a year, maybe um, quarterly scans, and some means of developer training, most typically computer-based training purchased from some security vendor. Um, so back to find, fix, prevent. This can be hard to do. Um, finding stuff can be hard to do. Defect discovery can be expensive because you've got to either pay for a scanner or an expensive security consultant. If you do something like use a scanner or, you know, 
run a bug bounty program, then you might have an issue with lots and lots of reports coming in, only a small percentage of which are actually valid. And so then you have to go and you find the skills, skilled people who can actually filter through those reports to find the valid ones or maybe tune um, your security tool uh, so that it will find better issues. There are also entire classes of um, security vulnerabilities that can't be found via a scanner um, and, and certainly business logic flaws uh, need a human to find them. Preventing can also be hard to do. Uh, this is really about training developers. Um, and that even assumes that you can train developers. So if you work for an organization that outsources software development, like, you, you know, you have very limited ability to influence the code that those developers are writing. And of course, as we've talked about, uh, fixing is hard. It's not just a technology problem. It requires technology and people and process to make it work. So given our typical scenario where an organization is doing some type of defect discovery and some type of developer training, really typical metrics are, well, how many apps did we test and how many developers did we train? The problem with this, from my perspective, is that these are measures of activity and not results. So if I think about the CIO talking to the CISO and Zynga, if you look at these numbers, how do you have any idea if the code's actually getting better? I don't think you do. So I'm going to go back to earlier in my TED presentation when we were talking about risk management objectives, and I'm going to look at one of them in particular, which is how do we prevent the same defects from occurring over and over again? Um, so again, typical metrics, how many apps did we test, how many developers did we train, doesn't tell you anything about if the software is getting better. But if we look at something like an organization's actual specific vulnerability types, and maybe we don't look at the top 11, but we look at the top three, you can actually do something like focus your effort and use that information to, for example, only train developers on these top three issues. So instead of a developer walking in the door and you handing them a 40 page coding standard and saying, read this and then do it, you know, maybe instead you've got like a four page cheat sheet um, or some sort of like one on one training where you're just talking about these three issues that are the, the actual most pre prevalent in your organization. So better metrics, I think, are if you look at the number of findings by vulnerability type and how many of those got fixed. So if you have your top vulnerability types for an organization, then you can actually structure all of these things around it. So if you know what your top three are, you can, for example, when it comes to finding, you can do things like tell pen testers to look for those specifically. You can do things like custom, customize static analysis rules to look for those in particular. Um, when it comes to fixing, you can maybe get executives and development teams to agree to fix those types of vulnerabilities if they're found. Um, and when it comes to prevention, as I mentioned, you can focus your training around those specific top three. So that could put you in a position where you know your top three, you're basing your entire application security program around those top three, and if you continue to track the numbers, then I feel like there's no way that you couldn't show actual progress the next time around. So that's what I got. We've got five minutes. Um, check out this website, download the pen test booklet. I have books up here if anyone wants them. Questions? Yeah. Another metric could be, as you progress through, is what is your increase in the number of common reusable modules? Yes. Because that would be a very strong indicator that you're mature. Yes, I think that's an excellent point. So the point being made is 
hey, Caroline, you didn't talk about like pre-made security features. You know, instead of, you know, having developers roll their own crypto, which I think is never a good idea, um, why not have this function that you could call, this feature that you could call, and keep track of the uses of these security built features, which actually is another BSIM activity. Thank you. I think that's an excellent point. Yeah, so this particular one is referring to testing of APIs, um, but I think that the the re the relation is, you know, how do you how do you pre-build some code that you know is secure and eliminate a developer from having to code something themselves, which potentially could be insecure. Just a real quick comment. I like the idea a lot about having an organization's top apps be a top five, top ten, whatever. Um, Part of that is, and this bridges to what you're talking about, is then doing root cause analysis. Oftentimes when I work with organizations that implemented the top three or top five, they're making the same mistakes over and over again because that's how the developers were taught. They're copying the same, you know, stack overflow pages, they got yeah. Apple insights, so this is how you do it. Right? So once you have that top X, you can do the root cause analysis and a more mature process build the library as well. Yeah, cool. Thank you so much. I totally agree. Um, and just for the, you know, recording, uh, the point being made is that another really important aspect to a well-rounded program is root cause analysis. So if you have an organization's top three, top five, top ten, whatever, you know, what, why are these developers continuing to put these types of things into the code? You know, is there sort of something about the process uh, earlier on that can be identified uh, and, and addressed. Thank you. So I think we're done. Um, ask me questions anytime. I'll be here. Um, and you can always reach me on Twitter or on email. Um, I would encourage you to download this Pentest Metrics booklet. Um, and I'm always, always interested in talking with folks about their metric situations um, and providing a perspective. Thank you.